Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is a review of the DJI Osmo Pocket 3, a compact camera aimed at vloggers and content creators. Launched in November 2023 and costing around $500 or pounds, or around $600 with the accessory bundle, the Pocket 3 continues DJI's cunning plan of essentially taking the camera and gimbal from a drone, but mounting them on a carrying handle instead. Now, I'm sure there's more to it than that, but it still resulted in one of the most compelling series of vlogging cameras to date. The latest Pocket 3's headline upgrades include a larger 1-inch type sensor with phase detect autofocus, 4K 120 and 10-bit video, a bigger 2-inch screen which cleverly rotates, improved tracking and a more convenient wireless microphone option. Before delving in though, a quick note about the Pocket 3 sensor, commonly described as being 1 inch but actually closer in surface area to your thumbnail. To be fair, that's no different from the 1 inch type sensors you'll find in Sony's ZV and Canon's G7X series. I just wanted to make that fact clear and the bottom line is it's still comfortably larger than the previous Pocket 2 sensor, which should hopefully mean lower noise, better dynamic range and maybe even the potential for some shallow depth of field effects. We'll find out in just a moment. Oh, and this is not a sponsored review. In fact, DJI couldn't even bother to contact me about the Pocket 3, so I went out and bought one with my own money. I then handed it over to my good friend and vlogging expert, Ben Harvey, who knows way more about these kind of products than I do. So, over to you, Ben. Thank you, Gordon. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Harvey. I'm a photographer and I make landscape photography videos here on YouTube, as well as tutorials and gear reviews. And the reason that Gordon has asked me to show you around the new Pocket 3 is because I use a variety of cameras to document my life and sometimes that requires an action camera to deal with the elements or just to go unnoticed. Let me give you a quick tour of this camera. This is the size of the camera without any accessories and it will do everything you need it to but attached to a tripod. The microphone receiver is built into the camera, therefore the camera and the wireless microphone is everything that you need to make this setup work. To switch the camera on, you simply thumb the screen clockwise, which will turn on the gimbal and the screen. And there's also an option to automatically record upon startup. You can also choose in the settings which direction the camera faces when you're turning it on. To start recording, you simply press the red record button. The joystick allows you to move the gimbal around, double tap the joystick to recenter the camera, or triple click to flip the camera around in the opposite direction, exactly as per the previous models. On the side, you've got a micro SD card slot. There's a microphone on each side and a third microphone on the back of the device. To the base of the camera is a USB-C port, which allows for charging and data transfer. Side by side, you can see that the Pocket 3 is a little bit bulkier than the Pocket 2, but it feels comfortable and well-made. It's also worth noting that the Pocket 3 is actually smaller than the Pocket 2 when you consider that the Pocket 2 required the do-it-all handle to speak with the wireless microphone, whereas the Pocket 3 that's built in. Now, once you add the handle extension to the Pocket 3, their proportions start to look similar. Now, as charming as the size of the standalone Pocket 3 may seem, once the screen is open, the grip is a little bit awkward and you'll appreciate the small handle extension, which puts your fingers and your thumbs in a more comfortable position. You're also going to benefit from a thread on the base of the camera, which you can attach a mini tripod or on a larger tripod to get it up to eye level. If you attach the battery handle, then the camera does become unnecessarily long, but it's still very comfortable to hold. And of course you'll benefit from a much longer battery life. More on that in a bit. Now, before we delve into the specs, let me set the scene for why so many people are excited about the release of the Pocket 3. The wish list for anyone creating video content is for great image quality, crisp audio, stable footage, and of course, the dream is for all of that to fit in your pocket. Now on my desk here is a selection of small cameras that you might describe as pocketable. That is, until you want to use filters, benefit from external audio, or you need to add a handle just to make it more comfortable to hold. Quite quickly, your action camera will go from looking like this to looking like this. Now, if you're rigging out an action camera, a phone or a 360 camera, then take into consideration that these all require digital stabilization, and that means faster shutter speeds. All right, here's a quick demonstration of why you shouldn't be using an action camera with slow shutter speeds. So at the moment I'm keeping the camera still and this might look like a great picture, but I've set my shutter speed to 1 50th of a second. And if I start to move with the camera, you might see that the background, it's, the camera's trying to stabilize the background. And what digital stabilization does is it requires faster shutter speeds to enable that stabilization. 
Now based upon my test, you cannot go slower than one one hundredth of a second. You therefore can't use video friendly shutter speeds with any of these small cameras. And further still, their low light performance suffers because of this requirement for a faster shutter speed. And this is why the Pocket series of cameras is different to everything else on the market. It doesn't rely upon digital stabilization. It's got a physical three axis gimbal, removing all of the shakes and the bumps. Plus filters and audios are integral to its design. There are other cameras on the market that have a one inch type sensor, but they don't fit into your pocket, especially when they're rigged out with microphones, filters, or they're on a gimbal. All that said, action cameras have their purpose. They are rugged, waterproof, and have a form factor that makes it much easier to mount them in obscure places. In contrast, the Pocket is a delicate camera with moving parts and shouldn't be exposed to water or expected to survive a tumble if you're snowboarding. The camera, which is built into the gimbal, shoots in 4K up to 50 frames per second with audio, or 100 frames per second without audio, which will automatically be slowed down for playback. Now, if you are wanting to shoot vertical video, then the good news is that the Pocket 3 has got you covered. Not only does it have a vertical screen, it also records 3K video in camera by utilizing the height of the sensor. On the Pocket 2, you literally had to rotate the camera around 90 degrees in order to create a video that was a vertical format. With the Pocket 3, the gimbal stays horizontal and you still get 3K output. So this is what the straight out of camera video footage looks like when shooting vertically. The one inch type sensor of the Pocket 3 is positively video oriented, doing away with the previous high resolution of 64 megapixels on the Pocket 2 in favor of better image quality and larger pixels. According to the spec sheet, the photographs from the Pocket 3 are approximately nine megapixels, which confirms that the 4K video is making the most of the width of the sensor. The Pocket 3 has also got the ability to shoot in 10-bit D-Log, which allows more flexibility when grading the footage. Here's the same scene shot in a standard picture profile next to the ungraded 10-bit footage, which has a very flat look to it, and now with the LUT applied, which was downloaded from DJI's website, to give it a bit more contrast and saturation. The standard picture profile is still a little bit flat when you compare it to the graded log footage, which is surprisingly accurate, especially in terms of the rendition of the color of my orange jacket. Now, based upon my tests, I would be shooting in D-Log and applying a LUT if you want to get the most out of your Pocket 3. One final note, the 10-bit log is not an option if you're shooting in 4K slow motion. If you delve into the menus, you'll see that there is a new product showcase mode, which prioritizes objects closest to the camera, which is ideal if you want to show your audience products and you don't want to worry about the camera focusing on your face. You can see from this demonstration here that the focusing is very quick and very accurate. Now the same as the Pocket 2, the Pocket 3 has got a 20 millimeter equivalent lens, but if you buy the Creator Combo Kit, you do get a wide angle adapter. They did that for the Pocket 2. This will take it up to the equivalent of a 15 millimeter lens. So if you take a note of how wide this frame is at the moment, I'll keep my hand there. And now you can see we've got about this much more room. So this might be the look you're going for, slightly wide angle lens, um, but you can see this tree here behind me is starting to get a bit of curve to it. Now, although that tree is leaning, if I take the filter off, you'll see it's straighter. So you do get a bit of distortion with this, but that's the wide angle look. So according to the spec sheet, the minimum focusing distance of this camera is 20 centimeters, which is exactly the same as the Pocket 2. So I've not got face detection enabled on this, and I would say that's about 20 centimeters. So Hopefully this is focusing on the leaf. Uh, any closer than that, I'd say it's probably not gonna be completely sharp. What's that? It's probably 15 centimeters. If that's focusing, then that is outperforming what the spec sheet says. So there you go, that's the minimum focusing distance. Now the lens is a 20 millimeter equivalent, the same as the Pocket 2. Although the fixed aperture has now reduced from f1.8 on the Pocket 2 down to f2 on the Pocket 3. The increase in sensor size easily makes up for this though, providing more background separation and better low light performance. On that topic, the ISO ranges from 50 to 6,400, but if you're in night mode, this opens up to ISO 12,800 and 16,000. You can see here from these video clips that I shot last weekend when I took it out to photograph some fireworks that it handles low light really well. And the focusing is also very well behaved. Okay, I have enabled face tracking and before the sun comes up, just wanted to see how good a job this does of focusing on my face, making sure it doesn't lose my face. So if you keep a close eye on the background here, the, there are some out of focus lights. 
Are they pulsing at all? Is it struggling to focus on my face or is it doing a good job? Now, which kit should you buy? At the time of making this video, there are two bundle options. You can buy the camera on its own, which includes the handle extension and the carry case, and that comes in at 489 pounds. Or if you go for the Creator Combo, which is what I opted for, that goes for 619 pounds. Although many of the items in the Creator Combo can be purchased separately, at the time of filming this, the wireless mic 2 cannot be purchased on its own. Which means that if you want to get good audio, you need to purchase the whole Creator Combo Kit. If you already own wireless or USB-C microphones, then you can plug those directly into the port on the camera. However, it is no longer going to fit in your pocket with the receiver dangling off the end. So at the moment, at the time of recording this, I don't have a set of ND filters for this camera. They're not yet available. However, as soon as they're out, I fully intend on using them so that I can get the correct shutter speed of 1 50th of a second and the motion blur starts to look natural. Um, but I just wanted to show you an example of what the video footage looks like. At the moment I've got face tracking on and I'm using the wireless microphone that comes with the Creator Combo Kit. In the Creator Combo Kit you'll get the wireless microphone with 8GB of internal storage, a windshield, a built-in clip with a magnetic attachment, as well as the battery handle, a hard carry case, a wide angle adapter, a mini tripod and a soft carry case. Now the battery handle provides a quoted 62% of additional battery to the internal battery. And when you plug in the battery handle, it starts to charge the internal battery on the camera. The power supply also prioritizes the internal battery. So once that's a capacity, it then charges the battery handle, almost like the battery handle is an external battery pack. The mini tripod is a good size and reassuring on a level surface. The carry case is well designed and it holds the wide angle adapter via magnets. There is also space to clip on the microphone as per the Pocket 2 case. The device is larger than the carry case which allows you to lever out the camera as it's quite a snug fit. Note that once the camera is in the hard protective case it will no longer fit inside the soft carry case especially with all of the other accessories. The camera alone is a very tight fit but with the extended handle it definitely won't fit. I would therefore consider the soft case to be for accessories unless you intend on assembling the camera each time you want to take it out of the pouch. Overall my advice is to get the Creator Combo as the idea of attaching a microphone receiver to a camera that has one built in seems counterintuitive and the whole purpose of this camera is that it fits into your pocket. Okay for comparison this is what the internal microphones sound like from arm's reach. Uh, the Pocket 3 has a total of three microphones, one on the back and one on each side of the device and that's what this sounds like. And for comparison this is what the external microphone sounds like. I'm using the wireless mic which you can see attached to my chest which is um, held on by magnets through my top. Now one of the features that DJI really don't seem to be shouting about much in the specs, they talk about the resolution and the one inch sensor and everything, but this external microphone that they've redesigned, which is why probably it's not compatible with the previous microphones, is that this records 32-bit float internally. So there are quite a few wireless microphones out there which have internal storage. This has got eight gigabytes, but this is recording 32-bit float into the microphone itself. Parallel to that, it's baking in an audio file to the video. So what I found is, if I bring the microphone right up to my mouth, I mean, that is absurdly close, and then I start to raise my voice, the audio levels still aren't clipping when I bring the video files into Final Cut. So not only is the audio on this absolutely amazing and it just seems to handle the volume, I've got a backup 32-bit float file saved onto the microphone itself. To enable this, you simply go into the menu and enable 32-bit and switch on the audio to video sync. These audio files are saved in a WAV format and you can plug the microphone straight into your computer via a USB-C cable. Small cameras are well known to have a bit too much sharpening applied, so I shot the same scene in various sharpness settings to see which one is the best. Here are three variations from minus two on the left, zero in the middle, and plus two on the right hand side. Now when I reviewed the Pocket 2 for Gordon's channel maybe three years ago, I came to the conclusion that the Pocket 2 was almost perfect, but there was still room for improvement with the low light performance, the focusing and the tracking, and the size of the screen. Now let's head down to the seafront to see if the focusing on the Pocket 3 is any better. Right, we're just doing a quick tracking test. I've double tapped on the screen on my face and it's now 
tracking my face wherever I go. So what I'm interested in is accuracy. If it loses me, does it then pick me back up again? Uh, what is also interesting is whether or not the tracking speed is nice as a viewer. As somebody using this camera, I would just get to grips with the fact that the tracking on it is quite quick and therefore just don't make quick movements and then you'll get nice, slow, subtle camera movements. So let's talk about the tracking and see how this does. Come on, here we go. Has it still got me? Okay. Now I reviewed the Pocket 2 for Gordon about three years ago and that's got Active Track 3.0. And I quickly came to the conclusion that that was not very good at all. In the Pocket 3, we now have Active Track 6.0. And from what I can see so far, this is doing a much, much better job. Now, at the moment, this is a very easy task for it to do. I've been filming this clip for a couple of minutes now, and it is still tracking me. I've not touched the screen since. Okay, next test. This is a little bit more difficult, so I'm going to double tap on my face. It is now tracking me. I'm going to get back on my one wheel and I'm going to go behind these columns. Still tracking me. And we're going behind the column, out the other side, behind the column, out the other side. It cannot handle those columns. Right, let's try something different. And does it still have me? It's still following me. Well done, Pocket 3. Here we go. We go again. Around, behind the columns. Nice continuous movement. And it still has me. So what I can say is it's not foolproof. However, the active track on this is significantly better. And if I was at close range, I would definitely trust it. Something a bit more complicated like this, you need to monitor that. And it's not just faces that this will track. I've just double tapped on the screen where this leaf is, and now it's doing a very good job of just tracking this leaf uh, within the limits of how far around the gimbal will move. So you can track anything, not just faces. Is it worth upgrading from the Pocket 2? If you're the current owner of the Pocket 2, you'll certainly be tempted to upgrade to the Pocket 3 as it has improved in some key areas. Let me show you how they compare side by side. All right, so I have got the Pocket 2 on that side and the Pocket 3 on this side. Side by side, same settings, 4K, 25 frames per second, no ND filters to make this fair. Uh, the size of the screen is significantly better on the Pocket 3. Um, and the screen on the Pocket 3 is way, way brighter. There you go, so that's what they look like side by side. And as you can see, the ability to see the much bigger, brighter screen on the Pocket 3 significantly better. Looking at the images side by side, you can see that the one inch sensor on the Pocket 3 is providing a nicer separation between the subject and the background. There's more dynamic range, witnessed by the blue sky on the Pocket 3 footage. And generally, the skin tones have been much improved on the Pocket 3. Better low light performance and the usability of a much larger rotating touchscreen, all improvements. The upgraded audio was an unexpected bonus as the Pocket 2 audio was already very good. Although the price tag was initially more than I expected, when you compare it to other cameras with a one inch type sensor, the Pocket 3 is actually pretty cheap. Now that the Pocket 3 is released, some of you might be thinking of downsizing. So maybe you already own a one inch sensor camera, one of the Sony ZV range maybe a micro four thirds crop sensor, or even a full frame camera. So on my right, I've got the Pocket 3, which has got my face being tracked, making a very easy job of it. And in the left hand side, I've got the Canon R8, which is a full frame camera with a 16 millimeter f2.8 lens. And that's on the smallest gimbal that I could find that will hold a full frame camera, which is the Xi'an Crane M3. So looking at the images side by side, is it worth carrying this around? Because my left arm hurts already. You tell me. Will I be getting a Pocket 3? Yes, this is mine now. Gordon is not getting this back. If you've got any questions, then let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.